Welcome to Truest Blood, the official True Blood podcast. I'm Kristen Bauer. And I'm Deborah Ann Wool. And you've been invited in. I want to do bad things with you. On Truest Blood. Welcome back to Truest Blood, where we sink our fangs into the series bite by bite. This week, we take a stroll down memory lane as we share all our favorite moments and behind-the-scenes stories from the fourth season. Plus, werewolves and witches and fairies. Oh, my. Oh, my. Where did all these fantastic creatures begin in our cultural imagination? The true story just might be stranger than fiction. So, Deb, you and I have had some sleepless nights watching season four, (laughs) cramming. 12 hours. Yeah, 12 (laughs) hours cramming for today to discuss all of season four, which is a lot. It's a lot. And I'm so curious because, as we've said, you and I didn't watch the show as it was airing. So I can't wait to hear what you thought of season four. Same. Same, honestly. So, so I have kind of a controversial take here. Well, um, what? As far as I understand, okay, season four is not maybe like the highest ranking season out there in the populace. Oh, I'm gonna go out and say this is my favorite season of True Blood so far. Okay, Dad. I know, mic drop. <laughs> what? What? Mic drop. I have had a whole conversation with myself for the last 12 hours yeah. thinking how much I was enjoying the season and I could not figure out if it was me enjoying watching me mm. more, <laughs> right? Well, that is an enormous factor in my decision, Kristen. Is it? It's an enormous factor in my decision. It is. So I, I have a theory on why this is my favorite. I do okay. think that people it could be that writers and actors are finding their groove right like Mm. i do think we are seeing each performer do the thing that they do best a hundred percent they're doing it really well they're at peak you know capacity of their Mm -hmm. talent you know in that way uh for for a lot of it um i i will get into this i think particularly fiona shaw and paula turbe doing this marnie antonia thing is just it's just Amazing. so fascinating to watch. I love the, the witch storyline. I do too. But I think above and beyond, the reason why this season sings for me is because we're all home. Mm. We're all in Bon Tom, right? We haven't split the cast oh, between right. Bon Tom and Dallas or Bon Tom and Mississippi. Like we are all at home right. dealing with the same essential storyline. You know, we all have right. separate little things, but we're our our storylines are entwined and it feels like everybody's getting more time. You know, it yep. always felt like in the previous seasons we had to spend so much time with the main storyline in another place that it meant the people in Bon Temps did not get the same kind of attention paid to their their roles. And this season, because we're all home, we're seeing more of you. We're seeing more of Jessica Tuck's Nan. Mm-hmm. You know, we're seeing more of Terry and Arlene. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just... I think so smart and this season really soars for me because we're all together. That is such a good point when I think about that because Tara comes back to town, Mm -hmm. you know, Sam has all his stuff at at home, everyone. And it, it is tough in the beginning of a series because it will be based on the lead and Mm -hmm. her life and what centers around it. And it does take seasons to explore the rest of the cast. Yes. Right. Absolutely. So I I you've got a very good point because we got to know everybody so much deeper. Yeah. Now, you know, I don't think it's a perfect season. There are things that I like less or more, but I Me think too. as an overall the feeling of it and and the the enjoyment that I got out of watching it is probably the highest so far. And and Me interestingly, too. and we'll get into this as we share our personal reflections, it was maybe my favorite to film. Uh, I loved shooting season four. The stuff that I yeah. got to do as Jessica and the leaps that her character made was very exciting for me. 
Yeah, I agree. You're, I mean, you just took it up a whole nother notch and the writing supported that. Your character so comes into her own. You know, she's finding her <laughs> vampire sea legs. Well, and you as well, yeah, right? Like, right. In a way, and you know, the fact that Eric had amnesia... <laughs> Right. Kind of, kind of got you out of sidekick land, you know. Like totally. finally, I can't believe it took them four freaking years to figure out what a gold mine they had in Kristen Bauer's Pam. And finally, we're getting to see, you know, really what an asset you are to the show on a, on a regular basis. So it's it's spectacular. We're gonna embarrass each other, the pants yeah, we are. of each other we in are. a minute. But before we do that, let's embarrass some other people. Okay, good. Um, like I said, I, I want to start with Fiona Shaw and Paola Turbe as uh, yeah. Marnie and Antonia. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, yeah. I, I'm just, I, every time they come on screen, I'm yeah. like, oh, what are they going to do now? I know. I know. They're so, what a tough, incredible <gasps> role. Fiona Shaw is so brave mm. and so good and so grounded. And I would be so intimidated. There's so much of this this season with <sighs> people playing other roles, yes. right, in yes. their body. And that's a challenge. I think that but you, you do imitations. To do imitations. And to do that at home, you know, you work on it and work on it. But I yeah. just think of that moment when you're in your first take and you're on the set and they say action, and you've got to mm. now make the transition from being Marnie to Antonia, and you're going to find out on its feet if it's working well, while 50 people stare at you. Yeah, I mean, from being Fiona to mm -hmm. Marnie to Antonia, and <laughs> right. then back again. You know, right. In succession. <laughs> so... Yeah, she's an English lady. <laughs> she's, she's, an, she's an English theater nerd, you know? <laughs> like, and now she's in so Hollywood just... on this vampire show doing night shoots at <laughs> Greer, pretending to be Marnie, pretending to be Antonia. And it's so amazing. I mean, there's that there's that scene where they do the where her face morphs between Marnie and Antonia, yeah. you know, back and forth. Yeah. And, you know, these are two women who don't look anything alike particularly, but right. it is one, I want to give it to the visual arts department who did whatever CGI. Where it's so seamless. Yeah. And it's like they have the same eyes and yeah. it, they match perfectly in their intensity. Yes. Right? Yes. And then we have these flashbacks with Paula and her energy. Oh, she's Oh, my so God. Beautiful. I was just knocked out of my socks every time I saw her. Yeah. I, I can't agree more. To do so much with so two little. Women. To so, so much. So much. She has a full story arc. Where we, she goes. She has almost like the Godric arc, right? So she yes, goes from yes. being vengeful to this is not who we are. Yeah, really it is a Godric impressive. arc, and I and then I think to have Marnie counter that and be the peaceful. We just want to practice our religion, mm -hmm. and then suddenly shift to like, ooh, power. <laughs> you know? Yeah, ooh, power. I is want such more. A, a great story. Yeah, because, you know, she it was interesting. She had a couple of lines where she was like, you know, I was born with this this oddity, this thing I can do and why. And that idea of being sort of a, a freak or a strange. But I was like, oh, it's like Sookie. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's that similar mm -hmm. space and mm -hmm. how different personalities choose to manage that. And you can see why someone who grew up feeling that way would get a taste of of power and 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 being mm -hmm. the person on top and in control might really be intoxicating. Yeah, the bullied becomes the bully. Yeah, yeah. Right. And speaking of people who get to play other people, <laughs> right. we have a lot of that going on this season. Um, yeah. Lafayette, Nelson, uh. gets to play a number of other people through his medium powers. Yeah, he was what had to play three different people distinctly. I believe and, so, and different languages right? and accents. and different right, different languages, <laughs> different accents, and tough in tough situations, right? So yes. in heartbreaking mm -hmm. situations, being scared, it, 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 he's he's just always, of course, 
going to be a marvel to watch do yeah. even the smallest moment. I, I One moment. That, I feel like such a broken clock. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, totally. Um, talking about his work is just like, I, I have no more ways to say you are excellent. You know, like there's just yeah. the synonyms don't exist. Right. Exactly. Yeah. There, there, it, 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 there aren't words to describe how sublimely yeah. he is. You know what I mean? Like what are the <laughs> words? You know, he, well, there was a, as a, just a small moment and I, I don't know, we kind of get used to these big moments being handled so adroitly, but there was, it was when they were in the bathroom at Moon Goddess and Jesus was trying to use the corpse to, you know, do whatever he's going to do to get Marnie, Antonio and Marnie separated. Mm. And, and Lafayette is watching this and taking mm. instructions. So he's doing, there's almost nothing for him to do. Right. And every moment and reaction I noticed as, wow. Yeah. He wasn't just, just present. He was yeah. just present and adding so much just to, present. okay, you know, would be yeah. his line. Yeah. Just a master, yeah. an absolute, unique, masterful yeah. human. And then, of course, we had the skinwalkers. Mm -hmm. So we have <laughs> Sam Trammell who is a remarkable mimic. Remarkable. <laughs> Doing a, a spot-on Marshall Tommy, you know. Yeah. I, I kind of, it's kind of <laughs> creepy how well he does. It, it, it was so spot-on that then I started noticing Tommy more, right? Because you were like, oh my gosh, yes. He, yes. he does walk it like revealed. that. It all of a sudden revealed yes. Tommy to me. So... Yes. Yeah, that was absolutely phenomenal. And even Dale Dale Raul got a got a shot at being yes. uh, being Tommy. Yes, as well, which was yes. so it was fun to see so her fun. so crass. It was so fun, and it was such a cute detail <sighs> that they screwed her hair up. Like Tommy didn't quite know how to do her hair. Yes, <laughs> he doesn't know how to do her hair and makeup. Oh my god, fantastic! And then um, Kevin Alejandro became other things <sighs> and creatures. Right. Yes. His demon face. And yeah. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I don't know if these things are in the books because by this point I had stopped reading the books. Mm -hmm. But it does make me think that the writers, certainly nothing you did was in the books and mm -hmm. nothing Lafayette did was in the books because he, he was dead mm -hmm. by then. And but it makes it does make me think about what you were talking about with us being home and just mm -hmm. getting to season four, that the writers now were inspiring each other in two directions. Yes. Yes. Right. So they're getting to know us. They're writing for us. They're having fun. Yeah. They know that we can do it. Yeah. And we've gotten into a really good relationship by season four. Well, we've established characters that we can now subvert. Yeah. Which brings me right into Bill this season. Yes. Who's so exciting. Yes. The fact that, like, he's been four different people throughout this show, I right? Know. He was. You know, the good boyfriend. Then he was working for Sookie, you know, working for Sophie Ann. And then we're yeah. like, we don't know who he's working for now, you know, now. He's been a vampire spy for the authority yeah. for at least 20, 30 years, right? And it's just yeah. so exciting. I love yeah. that idea. And so cool to see that flashback with Stephen as a, a, a British punk because totally. we all know that's a lot closer to who Stephen is than totally. Bill ever will be. Yeah, yeah, and we're piecing with these flashbacks. We get to piece together who these people are over a couple hundred years, yeah. right? So we had the Civil War version of Stephen, yes. of Bill, and now we've got, I love this punk guy with the 80s probably, yeah. you know, so and, fun. And then to contrast that with politician, mm. vampire, king. you know, ruthless leader king, like, whoa, interesting. So interesting. Yeah. yeah. I think I wrote in my notes towards the beginning. Oh, wow. He's like an asshole now because he was so uh, sweet, good antithesis of the typical vampire. And right. he's just now king and and owning it. 
comfortably. Yeah. Well, and again, it's it's this it's this contrast. So we mm-hmm. have, you know, we see because Bill is a sweet, soft person, right? I think he does yeah. genuinely feel for Sookie in that way. But yeah. that doesn't mean he can't be have that ruthless hard exterior. And similarly yeah. then with Eric, who we thought was all ruthless hard exterior, now is revealed quite a soft heart with this amnesia. Once once mm-hmm. the kind of memory of all of his crimes is taken away, his mm-hmm. pure essence can come forth. Um, yeah, they really flopped. <laughs> they flip-flopped. And I think the idea, you know, the, in the end, the, it ended up balancing them both, right? They're both right. less of an archetype and more of a three-dimensional person uh, because yeah. of that. Yeah, it was interesting where, because, you know, the sweet Alex that I know, who's so funny, yeah. I want him to just be doing yeah. ro- romantic comedies because this is the <laughs> funniest guy. Uh, he's so witty, right. Right? right? And and so charming. And so we, I got to see a little bit more of that in him on the screen, which was yeah. really fun for me. And then also... Maybe it's my sort of wounded self-esteem self or something, mm. but I really liked when he became the bad boy again. It's just bad boys yes. are sexy, right? So I liked that They're Bill sexy. got to be more of a bad boy. And then I yes. liked when we had bad boy Eric back. Well, and what's good is it because after after the amnesia, you know, which was basically just a sexcapade for a few episodes there. Yeah. Um, we get we just get a more well-rounded Eric, right? We get yeah. e- exactly who he was back, but right. we have deeper insight into who right. he is. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think it really it served both characters this season to, you know, to to subvert their archetypes a little bit. It's really kudos to the writers because a lot was going on and they still had these fabulous arcs in mind. Yes. So they 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 I think, again, because we were all at home, Mm -hmm. there's time for both plot and character. So, you know, not everything has to be plot. We have time to kind of interweave those. And, you know, the writers, I just think, found their stride. And and one of the places they found their stride was with Pam Swinford de Beaufort, (laughs) Um, because I just every time you were on screen, I was like, who is this incredible, like, woman who's like blossoming in front of us here? And it's just, again, similarly to take what Pam had been, which was kind of a fun one-liner, mm-hmm. you know, sidekick character. And now we're, it's just so much more. Mm-hmm. Um, they gave you so much more to play with. Yeah. And you just deliver every freaking second. And it's funny. And you're horrible, but I love you. Um, I don't know. I can't. I can't gush enough. <laughs> that is so true. Pam is so horrible, and we love her so much. So horrible. She's horrible, oh and yet is doing and saying. I think what most of us want to do, you know, <laughs> right? I think she's. Well, but again, I think. It, uh-huh. it goes back to that conversation we had about villains yeah. where like it isn't just the the boundary pushing of being a villain. It's a boundary pushing of just society and tradition. Right. Like mm-hmm. it is. It's being able mm-hmm. to say what everyone is thinking, but is too polite mm-hmm. or traditional or stuck in their ways to say. Yes. Um, so there's so much freedom and fun in that. And we get to live vicariously through you. Yeah, I agree. And I got to live vicariously through her. And yeah. I really loved so much having my own storyline. And the fact that there yeah. was also this prosthetic. Despite the horrible prosthetic work. <laughs> yeah. And it's challenging. It's freaking challenging. You know, oh. it's many hours where, you know, and then you start work at 6 a.m., you know, and yeah, so yeah. it's challenging. And I couldn't see out of one eye, which is actually mm-hmm. totally bizarre. Mm-hmm. I would not know where my scene partner was. I realized why there's a two yeah. eye system. And right. right? <laughs> and like one time they were, you know, it was, I think it was in that scene with Alex where we're in prison. And he's like, what smells? <laughs> Yes. She's like, it's me. <laughs> it's me. She's like under the sheet. 
There was a lot of humor in it, too. There was one line. You so, take it off, and then he goes, oh. <laughs> So deadpan and small, but it's so good. It's so deadpan and small. Well, I just want to give a huge shout out to this to the special effects prosthetics yeah. team because you they are in close up close on you in that up. prosthetic. Yeah. They are way in tight there. There's no blurry, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that had to be sp- Bought on, and you had to manipulate it. You had to put your fingers in it and mm-hmm. talk and blink. Mm-hmm. And wow, there what was a job a, they did. It was an incredible, incredible job. And we had to do it multiple times. So there was huge mm-hmm. continuity. So they had made multiple I pieces, bet. right? And every time would be a often a different makeup artist from Masters FX doing it. <sighs> but I even had a mouthpiece inside with a piece of fabric attached to it that went down, which came out of my mouth, at the corner of my mouth and wrapped around under my jaw on, and was glued to my neck to pull half my face down. So there was, Ugh. right? So it was really intensely designed and it had to progress. Yeah. yeah. Right? She kept rotting. <laughs> so. And then they came up with magical, magical juice to, to inject into you so you didn't have to wear it anymore. Yes. Which is very nice of them. Which was very nice of them. But I also <laughs> love that in between, like they ripped the skin off, whole nother look. Then yes. I'm the the fetus, right, in the coffin. Yes. So it, they were just, it was absolutely fascinating to be part of that process. Yeah. Well, I have to say also, without without being too shallow about it, um, even with all the rotting, you're very, very sexy, I have to say. Really? <laughs> you don't lose an ounce of your hotness beneath <laughs> all of the the yuck. I, um, I kept, I noticed was fun, I, cause, cause, that I was like doing yeah. my hand on the hip and my hip out and stuff. So I was still maintaining <laughs> yes. my sexiness like throughout. It was all still there. Because I, I also had to wear some yuck uh, quite a bit this season because of all the silvering and then walking into yeah. the sun. And I remember when I was at Masters Effects and they were putting on the burn and stuff on my face and they started with the lightest and we took a picture of that and then like progressively went so that they could show, you okay. know, where where do you want this to live to the writers, directors. Um, and I remember taking a picture at one point to send to my, my boyfriend just being like, would you still make out with me? <laughs> because I knew I had to kiss Jason. <laughs> And I was like, we can't go so far <laughs> right. that you wouldn't you wouldn't want to kiss this person, but it should still look gross. So that was like our barometers. Would would my boyfriend, my yeah, actual like nothing boyfriend, should be still make peeling out off, me? right? Like, <laughs> also in return was absolutely loving everything you did. All oh. the the breakup, the the yeah. arc of like fighting who yeah. this vampire person is now, and then giving into it, feeling bad about it, glamoring Hoyt because oh, you were like, so "Oh, I hurt him! Oh my god, dark. I hurt him! I hurt him!" Yeah, it's so dark. But who among us can say we wouldn't? Oh. We wouldn't be tempted by that, right? Oh, oh, I think most people, given that power, would not be able yeah. to not use it. I and mean, and she's right, eighteen at this point, maybe you know, oh, like, right, ooh. right. In terms of her, like mental development, psychological de- development. Yeah, I I think it was fascinating. You know, the the breakup with Hoyt. A, cu- a couple of interesting things that I remember is I remember Alan Ball called me into his office before the season to say, hey, I know that you and Jim are very attached to this storyline, and I want to let you know that this season we're going to be breaking them up and, you know, having some other stuff come in. And I just thought that was so classy and oh my cool gosh. to not just let me be surprised by it, but to kind of let me in on the process and mm. why they were thinking of doing this and how, you know, how it was going to work. And and just that the respect that he had for, for me and Jim and Ryan to know wow. that, like, actors get attached to these things. Wow. Um, and I just I was really floored by that. And again... 
never since then have I had a showrunner put in that kind of effort, you know, to to care for me that way. That um, is not totally true. I'm, I'm going to give Eric Olson a shout out here and say he is also a spectacular showrunner. OK, um, but that was very, very cool of Alan, I thought. Yeah, I'm trying um, to think if I had a showrunner that ever... I'm like, no, I just can't think of anyone that yeah. could come close to Alan Ball. And there's other people I've heard that he did that for. We'll talk about in season five, but yeah, it's really yeah unique. Yeah. Going, going into those scenes with Hoyt, it was good. It was one good for me to know because I, I went back and really thought a lot about where Jessica was coming from mm -hmm. and the um, abuse she had suffered at home before being made a vampire mm -hmm. and thinking about how when you're with someone who even though they love you kicks the wall throws things you know and I don't think Hoyt you know is like her father but that kind of behavior lands differently on you yes. when that's your experience yes. and I remember doing a lot of research at the time and really thinking about how powerless and infantilizing that feels when you're recognizing behavior from your parent in your partner right um even if they're not going to that extent it's just it's a different experience um, yes and you know she really she was with you know under the the reign of her the tyranny of her father then got made and was controlled by bill mm -hmm. then hooked up with hoyt and has been living with hoyt so jessica has not been herself she's not right. had an opportunity to figure out who she is on her own and I think all of the things that they wrote for me to say to him are true. It doesn't mean they're not hurtful, right? but they're true. We moved too fast. We're each other's first real relationship. We moved in together. You want, obviously, to have kids and be out in the sun and have these things. And that's not something I can do, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so I think she's just because you love someone doesn't mean it's going to work. Yeah. And that is the very, very sad truth i think yeah um and the then writing really the, was great and you guys pulled yeah. it off so great because i'm thinking about how that goes down and how his reaction to that is yeah. to be terribly hurtful and aggressive to cover well that's the i mean that's the amazing thing right like the things the power we have as a as a partner in a love relationship is you know exactly what to say yeah. to tear that person down. Right. And you just choose not to because you love them. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, but you know. <laughs> right. We all know what, you know, the thing that our partner is most sensitive about. Yeah. Uh, and he just in that moment is so hurt that he, he lets that loose. And it's interesting then going through to Jason. Mm hmm and I don't know. I'm so I remember at the time being so interested in what that pairing meant. Yeah. Um, you know, because they they yeah. Uh <laughs> it's very interesting, right? They, you're like Jason and it's Jessica. Very interesting. And then you're watching it going, oh my God, somehow this makes sense. I think it makes <gasps> sense. I think. You know, again, so, so, you know, Jason falls in love so easily, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and Jessica probably too, but mm -hmm. they're probably not really suited for <laughs> monogamous relationships, at least at this point in their life anyways. Mm -hmm. And yet they've both been judged, right? Jason is mm -hmm. so heavily judged for his promiscuity and, and Jessica, because she's a woman of course mm -hmm. is judged for that and her vampirism and mm -hmm. and so in a way being able to come together and be like hey we're the people who everybody looks at and looks down on and thinks that we're not serious or not enough um and there's that great i love that conversation in, in the moonlight um in the sixth, sixth sixth or seventh episode big sixth it's the first time ryan and i really has seen together and he is so fun he's so free uh... and i I just, the, I, we had, I had so much fun that night uh. um, doing that scene. It was actually warm. Uh. <laughs> so we actually were like happy to just like sit out there and get to know each other better as like oh actors gosh. as well. Um, and they have that conversation where, you know, he talks about how he doesn't feel special because Sookie was 
And yeah. I get to say to him, how can you not think that you are special? Right. And then talk about how special I feel for being a vampire. Right. Which Hoyt cannot and does not appreciate. Right. At, at this point in time. Right. right. The resentment won't let him. Right. And so it is this moment for both of them to be like, we actually really like ourselves, <gasps> even if no one else does. You right. know? And right. what a special bonding moment that is. Um. I don't know. I'm so I, I'm so grateful for the Jessica and Hoyt storyline, and I'm so grateful for the Jessica single slash, you know, Jason uh, storyline yeah. as well, because it just allowed so much transition and growth. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that it was just written so wonderfully, because if Hoyt yeah. hadn't been cruel, we mm. would not have been able to see you hook up with Hoyt's best friend, <laughs> right? But he was cruel. And then also they put in the scene. It's still hard. Still hard. And then mm -hmm. Ryan goes to Hoyt and confesses yeah. and lets him be beaten. So they were very clever. And then were you saying to Jason... I don't want a monogamous relationship. So it's okay if we basically just have sex and like, you know, could I even go down on you because Hoyt was afraid of it? You know what I mean? It's like yeah. for yeah. Jason and he's drink your blood. So all of it was orchestrated where we're like, yep, this, we, we see <laughs> how this happened and then we get to enjoy watching it. And it was also beautiful, beautifully shot. Hmm like really mm -hmm. gorgeous to look at. So, oh, that final sex scene. Yeah. Right? I, and I remember again another another feather in Alan Ball's hat. We shot that, and I think the final cut was more explicit than they had originally thought it was going to be. Okay. And again, to Alan Ball's credit, this is in a pre um intimacy coordinator era, right? And right. I I felt very taken care of. Ryan is absolutely the best scene partner to have in those scenarios. Scott Winant's the best director. Ryle Tucker's the best writer. Like, yeah. very well taken care of. But Alan Ball, again, calls me in his room, into his office, and he says, I want you to watch this scene because it is a little more explicit than we originally had thought on the paper. And if you don't want it, you don't like it, we will fix it. Oh, my god! Like, gosh. he gave me the opportunity to approve how, you know, what it was. And, and, in the end, I didn't, I, you know, I did not ask to change anything, but he wanted me to see it. He wanted me to know. Oh, I've never that heard that, of that. You know, had been a thing. And, you know, it's not that it like had violated my contract or anything like that, but it was just, it was just a little more than it was mm -hmm. on the page. And that he was sensitive to that mm. was so remarkable. And again, mm. I, I, that's just feels like above and beyond, um, for this industry sometimes. It is. I could just keep thinking we really were ruined by doing this show. Yeah. yeah. We were ruined. We were. Well, the last thing we, we have to talk about before we finish this section yeah. is, of course, the funny walks outside of Moon Cottage. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. We may have already shared this on this podcast, but we will reiterate because it is my favorite moment from this show. Deb, I'm not so, sure. Have you ever laughed that hard in your life? Not just no, on True in Blood. In my life? No. I think... I'm laughing too hard now. <laughs> okay. You laugh I'm gonna set the stage at here. me. Let's be clear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I admit I laughed at Kristen Bauer. We were not laughing with her. We no, no. Laughing at her. <laughs> and, so, and not only Deb, the setting the stage. entire crew. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. What I saw set. after cut. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're setting the stage. So okay. we're at Moon Goddess Emporium. Yeah. They've got a force field up around. Right, storm. right, right. Inside, they're doing magic that's going to make us all walk into the daylight force field and kill us, right? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so our direction is to walk like we're resisting, but we're being pulled against uh -huh. our will uh -huh. towards this force field. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But somehow, I think because you had the rocket launcher, <laughs> Stephen and Alex and I are all like three steps and then we're off camera. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And Kristen's like 500 feet away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Easily. So, there is Felt like no a thousand. way 
to do this walk <laughs> elegantly in a cool. It, it, we all looked so stupid. Yeah. But the three of us are like, one, two, three, turn around, yeah. watch Kristen. And here I am, blocks away, blocks away, trying to figure out how to wiggle my body <laughs> in a manner that shows that there's a force fucking field. How would oh you do God. this? And 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 right before we rolled, and I sort oh. of like Layman came out, Michael Layman, <sighs> our fabulous director. He came out and he goes, "Yep, okay, so we're gonna do this, and you're being pulled into the force field. So let's just try one." And I'm like looking at where my mark is and looking at where your marks are, and I went, uh, and the fact that I didn't practice this in the mirror at home, and really wishing I was someone who did my homework. Oh and I went, God. um. Yeah. So can we all make a pact that we're not going to laugh at each other? And <laughs> Stephen and Alex went, yes, from no. now on. They were like, no way. Let's roll. I mean, they were. So what I oh, see Mr. from my Man. perspective, a block away, wiggling my body like it, it was so ridiculous, was Alex and Stephen take Alex took one and a half steps because he's so tall. Yeah. Stephen just... was maybe two steps. Lunges. <laughs> you were like 10 steps. But the second Alex and Stephen yeah. got behind the camera, they turned around to watch me with these, like, <laughs> almost like they had popcorn. Oh, yeah. We couldn't wait. We were very excited about it. <laughs> and so the fast, so that's our first take, which maybe got used. It's hard to know what actually yeah, ended up in the cut. Yeah. But I remember Layman coming out and being like, so that's not going to work. <laughs> and what we... <laughs> And he looked at me so what we ended with up like doing... kindness. He goes, I won't use that because everyone's laughing. No, no, there's a step in between, Deb, because then you yeah. and everyone were like, we got to watch playback. Can we watch playback? And everyone ran over to the monitor and they played it back. And everyone stood around crying, laughing at me. Oh my God! It was the greatest moment. We needed it so bad because it was a whole it week was shooting great. those that night sequence in in a small town far away. So we were all staying in a hotel and yeah. getting very little sleep and doing this. So we, you know, we part of how you get through these extraordinarily difficult shoot weeks yeah. is crew, cast, everyone there yeah. has to just be in on the fun and totally for it wherever we can, totally. having a, a good sense of humor and a good uh, attitude about it. Yeah. Um, but I do remember eventually. They did have like, a, 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 you know, a grip or somebody. They put ropes around, around our hips or something or mm -hmm. our waists mm -hmm. so that they could pull and we could resist but still move forward. And I think that worked a lot better. Yeah. And they, they could still like remove the, the ropes and post or something. So I, 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 I think that's what they had. <laughs> I know. And still, Deb, when I watched it and I saw because oh. you're on Jason and yeah. you're fang, you fang out. And then you move one leg and then you move one arm. And I was like, brilliant, brilliant. That chick really, she, did she practice? I think about these things. You th And it showed and it was great. And I was jealous all over again. That was Aww. such a fun. Aww. I loved actually all night. of it. Like being, yeah. you know, the butt of the joke. And I... And I remember Lana, yeah. my my makeup artist, coming over, and she had tears streaming on her face. She was trying to touch yeah. me up, and she was trying so hard to not laugh. And I go, you can laugh. And she said, Deb, the nicest person on earth, laughed so hard. I just had to clean up the tears on her neck. <laughs> Like you had tears running down it's the front true. of your body. It was it was too much. It was but, amazing. You know, to come full circle on this and, and bring this to a close, you know, I think the family nature of this, the fact that I yeah. had a scene with Stephen and you and Ryan and Alex yeah. and, and the others were inside. And, you know, like we were all together. We, we were, were together. All in Bon Temps, Shreveport, home. Yeah. You know, just made the the secret sauce of this episode, both off camera and on. It was, it is such, I love the memories of the times when, in La Puente, where we shot that, yep. it is one of my favorite memories. And yeah. when people are rewatching this episode, when we get out of the van, when we show up and get out of the van and they kind of slowed it down 
I have an ego moment of how cool and badass we look as vampires together. <laughs> We're in our SWAT gear. You know, another smart thing I'll just say as a last thing, but we had all these guns strapped to us. And here I am where I've been on a lot of stuff and Deb is new and we do the blocking. And after we've done the master shot where now you're stuck with what you did in the rehearsal, I right. glance over at you and you have no guns. Now these things are heavy and we're there for five <laughs> nights. And I go, how'd you get rid of your guns? And you go, I just set them down. And you knew... <laughs> I was like, this rookie, season four, <laughs> is now, and then you knew how to do the funny walk. So, yeah, I was like, yeah. Deb, yeah. Deb. You were like, yeah, they're heavy. I just set them down. And I had The, the apprentice has become the teacher. The apprentice. Be, <laughs> and I'm carrying those things. My shoulders are hurting for five days, and I was thinking about yeah. that. By the way, just I have to say, as a little aside, I mean, the, yeah. Terry and Arlene, all these yes. actors, so fabulous. I do have to just there's make so a, much to talk about. We're there's so much we're to talk about. We're always going to leave people out, but holy crud, yeah. But holy crud, and also WTF on giving them that creepy doll. Like that is a bizarre storyline mm. to sell. I know. Because I they, it's my fault, and it's your like <laughs> Jessica gave it to them. It's my fault. It's a, when you were shooting the scene, you were like, "Really? I don't just throw this old crappy thing in the trash. I'm going to go give it to Arlene." As like, here's I didn't yeah. go buy a Cabbage Patch doll for the kid. I bring it this thing that's like terrifying and ugly, and they keep it with. Well, we couldn't get rid of it, so we figured better give it to a to an infant yeah yeah yeah, exactly it keeps coming back bizarrely but you're like you know what i'll give it to someone that yeah. i like it was just and then they keep it with the baby no matter where the baby goes so that i think is a little bit of a hard sell but terry and arlene <laughs> right terry and arlene just I always mean, yeah. knock carrie, it out of the carrie park. and todd carrie and todd yeah, and, and then andy same chris two, bauer yeah yeah. And Lauren Bowles as Holly. Oh, um, great. You know, again, they're so fantastic and everything. And of course, it's just hard to fit everyone in, but we love them. <laughs> hey, and wait a minute. Luna, our producer. Yes, of course. We have Janina Gavankar this season. Uh -huh. We're going to talk to her next season. Yeah. So, you know, we're saving some of that for that. But Duh. Yeah, duh. I mean, that's she's, extraordinary. She, yeah, we're here talking about True Blood to you yes. because of Luna. Welcome to Kristen's Clip Corner. Hello, friends and enemies. It's a beautiful day on the bayou. Today, we'd like to share with you a few of the snappiest, sexiest, and silliest one-liners from the hundreds we heard this season on True Blood. I gotta say, Kristen, most of my picks are Pam. I gotta say, most of my picks are Pam. All right, kids, feast your ears on this. You've reached Officer Jason Stackhouse. This is emergency. Dial 911 and ask for me. Or leave a message here. Please. Utterly. We blow up these wicked dipshits already. I got a man who it for. I liked you better when you were brain damaged. I know I'm a vampire, Snooky. It's Sookie. I know what I am. I have to say, for a badass werewolf, you drive like a girl. You two lovebirds go on home, okay? And let these good people practice their constitutional right to be fucking idiots. Jesus, tits and God, America, Jason. What the fuck is happening to me? over Sookie and her precious fairy vagina and her unbelievably stupid name. Fuck Sookie! Stop saying fuck. I can't concentrate. That's some catchy shit for your head, Stone. Good night. So 
Deb, you did some fabulous homework, and I'm realizing that I didn't, yes. I'm not even sure I Googled playing a vampire, and I'm, jeez, what's <laughs> something wrong with me, I'm realizing. So, myths and lore, and you did, yes. you got so much interesting information here. It says at the top of the outline you gave me, almost every culture on earth has some form of myth revolving around an undead being returning in search of blood, which is actually sort of astounding. Yes. But the modern vampire archetype is entirely descendant of the European folklore, right? So we can focus, Mm -hmm. you're saying we can focus our thoughts. It's so sweet that you say we, because this is really you, Scully. (laughs) And it is so interesting. Yes, we we can out me... (laughs) Yeah. You can out me as the overachiever that I am. Um, <laughs> I'm also enormously geeky about lore. I I really, really love the oral traditions, these yeah. stories, these superstitions that yeah. we have been telling ourselves for so long and the reasons why we tell them. Um, yeah. So as I said, you know, again, it's a fascinating topic there. Again, every culture in the world has some form wow. of vampire, you know, vampiric uh, archetype. Um, but the modern vampire that we're used to really does come from that European folklore. So we'll, we'll stick there. Um, yeah. So interesting. Yeah. So we, we have obviously vampires. We're going to talk mostly about that, but we also have witches mm-hmm. this season. So there's some interesting history surrounding witches. Mm-hmm. And the, the really interesting thing is actually going back and starting with physical evidence, right? Mm. So, you know, a lot of these things come out of unexplainable you know, the, the supernatural is really just the preternatural is, is one thing I've heard it say. It's mm-hmm. it's it's a natural occurring thing that we just don't yet have an explanation for. Right. So we call it the supernatural. So um, one really interesting thing we we see in the 1700s, it's called the Age of Enlightenment because we, we think about it as a time where we're coming out of this era of superstition and hysteria. You know, the 1600s are the witch trials and these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. We're, we're leaning into science and logic. Um, but interestingly, vampire lore takes a huge increase. There is huh. so there are there's such a, a an increase in the incidence of vampire stories and uh, you know real life a- accusations going on during this the 1700s time period. Oh. And I think it's because of physical evidence because you know in the 1700s we're so obsessed with science and and physical evidence and we have physical evidence that was being misinterpreted at the time. So I want to give a little right. sort of warning here. If you're a fan of True Blood, you probably don't have an issue with like body gore or <laughs> blood or anything like that. But we're we're going to we're going to get into it here a little bit and um talk about decomposing bodies. Mm. So Yes. So one place where they believe the the vampire myth to have arisen is a, a mistaken understanding about body decomposition and how hmm. that works. Now, we know today that that can vary tremendously depending on, you know, when the person was buried. Was mm-hmm. it cold or hot? What's the type of soil they're in a casket or not? These things mm-hmm. can vary, you know, how a body decomposes. Mm-hmm. So when people would start to get sick in these small villages where, you know, superstition is maybe still, you know, alive. Um, And it would be centered in families. Uh, A lot of times we're talking about pneumatic things like tuberculosis, where you become very pale and very weak and you're coughing up blood. Uh, And so you look very much like you are losing blood. Right. And then people start dying in these families. And the sickness can sometimes also give way to visions and dreams, just as any of us might have um, you know, those kinds of reactions. And people will see their dead family members in these visions and say, mm. they visited me in the night. Mm. So now we think, oh, no, maybe we have a vampire in our midst. And also, if your right. cattle is dying, your sheep are dying, things like that. Right. OK, so now it's going to get a little bit fun and gross because we're going to talk about the bodies. So they go and they exhume these bodies. Now, the interesting thing is that some of them are going to appear very decomposed. So you go, OK, that was a you know, normal person who died. But others 
as bodies decompose, the skin pulls away from the nails, the gum line recedes around the teeth, the skin pulls mm. away from the hair, hair and beards appear to grow. Mm. So you see a person <laughs> with long nails and long teeth and longer hair. Right. Uh, they also will bloat with the gases from decomposition. So a, a person who was quite frail in life will appear well fed. Their ah. skin complexion will be reddened and ruddy. Plus, the the juices of the decomposing innards will start to leak from their mouth, appearing to be blood. So you see this, this person in a coffin that appears well-fed, dripping blood from their mouths. Right. And uh, the instinct then is to stake them. Ah. And when they would do this and the gases would get released, it would push the gases past the vocal cords in the throat, ah. creating a death moan so that these these corpses would actually gurgle, you know, with this escaping gas, right. which would like they were just dying, would seem like a death thrall in that moment. And and I think, again, at the time with the scientific knowledge that they had, what a terrifying <laughs> experience that right. would be and right. it would certainly seem to be evidence of of something supernatural occurring yeah when you have nothing scientifically to explain even a yeah. a disease that could be contagious you have no understanding of any of these processes you're going to the mind is going to yeah. try to come up with and fill in that huge gap Yes, that blank. And we have, you know, infectious disease experts writing papers on certain cases. Um, you know, famous ones are uh, Mercy Brown and and Blagojevich and, you know, these these people you can look up where they have actual experts, government people. In fact, the government executed or or exhumed bodies and investigated vampires wow. <laughs> throughout this uh, century, which is fascinating that it leads mm -hmm. so much credence to that. Um, uh, you know, another common issue that they had at the time because of poorly diagnosing uh, was uh, burying people alive. Um, right. Comas. Uh, uh, you know, just uh, non-responsiveness uh, was a thing and it was hard to diagnose. And so sometimes they would open coffins to find claw marks or people had tried right. to, you know, f bite their way out. Uh, it, it, it was kind of a thing. In fact, it became later on in the years became such a, a scary thing, this idea of being buried alive, that a, a device called Benson's Belfry was uh -huh. uh, developed, which is essentially uh -huh. a, a little bell on a string yeah. that goes all the way down into the coffin so that if oh you my wake God. up, what if you the string ring broke? that little bell. Like you'd be, you'd be ringing that bell so <laughs> hard if you came to and then the string breaks. <laughs> Well, honestly, more often than not, because it wasn't like a common occurrence, more often than not, bells would ring because of the wind or, right. you know, earth right. tremors. And then all these people are being unburied uh, kind <sighs> of for no reason. So, you know, it's a wild, wild time. Um, and so many of these vampiric folkloric tales, I, you know, are, are often attributed to these, you know, misunderstanding of, of nature and how that works. I think it's interesting. Um, I always think of when I hear stories like this or I, I realize that we think now we're at the cutting edge yeah. and we know everything, <laughs> but they thought that so then. So we're having yep. these explanations for what's happening. Yes. In the same way, it's good to remember that we're filling yes. those gaps for what we don't know. And what we don't know about embodied life is about all of it. So, yeah. And then I think also, you know, the other, yeah, the other layer to put on that mm -hmm. historically is that, of course, we are talking about extreme prejudice. You know, we are right. talking about times where, right. you know, accusations are thrown based on very little except dislike and distrust. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So we go back, we look at something like the Salem witch trials and mm -hmm. we see that, um, you know, at this time, it, we, you know, it's fairly uh, common. It's one of the most sort of notorious uh, witch trials, although it was by no means unique. It had been going on for centuries before then. Wow. Um, so these young girls were having fits of like supernatural intensity and, and no doctors could explain bodily why this was happening. Mm. 
Um, and as they increase, they started to accuse local women of being witches. Now, these are, of course, based on gender, but also race, religious adherence, if you were not mm -hmm. a very good Christian, mm -hmm. um, class, and then often just personal feuds. Wow. Um, and all of these things then get people accused and put on trial. And, and the trials were renowned for the use of spectral evidence, which is essentially just testimony from the victims claiming to have seen apparitions of the witches. Uh -huh. um, fascinating. I mean, out of all of this, I mean, and really quite terrible. I mean, with the Salem witch trials alone, I think over 200 people were accused Oh 30 God. were found guilty and 19 were executed, five more of those dying in jail. Um, and the cool little tidbit that you picked out of my notes <laughs> yeah. is that among the 19 executed, two were dogs. Two dogs! Two dogs! Accused of witchcraft. Now I'm really mad. You know, the other things, there's also, you know, as we go back and look at these things that, you know, obviously, as you said, extreme prejudice uh, as well as hysteria and potentially a need to a need for attention for these young girls and stress mm. is a lot of what came into it. However, they have also done some research and discovered that um, they they were all the the grain of choice was rye. And at the time, there was uh, an infestation of a fungus on this rye, and the fungus is the base substance in LSD. So there is even a possibility that some of that was working on these young women. So, it, you know, who knows? It's a combination of a lot wow. of things, but it they all come together to create this, you know, really terrifying situation. So fascinating. But it's interesting because I think we look at Antonia, you know, and I think True Blood is doing a really good job then of saying, here's the history and the hysteria. But what if it's also real, but they still shouldn't be persecuted? You know, and it's just a mm -hmm. really nice way to kind of bring both the, the, the history and the reality as well as the fun supernatural element and actually have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. The writers, I think, always from their own lives and perspective, and they're just really interesting people do such a good job of exactly yeah. what you just said is making the yeah. supernatural kind of a way for us to examine these these human traits that are not so fabulous yeah. and it's still happening today right our prejudices with social media and we just don't like someone and cancel culture whatever these things yeah. build steam in the same way the exact same way that they did with the witch trials yeah. And well, that is a, a perfect example of one of the, again, more notorious vampire figures in history, which was Elizabeth Bathory. So this is 1600 Hungary. Um, she was accused of torturing and killing hundreds of girls and women between 1590 and 1610. Uh, she was accused, the stories are, that she created a... Um, uh, a, uh, a courtly etiquette school for the, you know, girls, the, the daughters of lesser gentry. They could come to her school, learn how to be uh, courtly women and therefore secure a better match, which was the only way to survive as a woman at the time. But these girls never came home or if they were found, they were dead with weird markings on them. And so she was accused of bathing, of torturing and killing them and then bathing in their blood to remain young forever. Now, here's the interesting pieces that come out as we look back on this, right? Yeah. So one thing we learned is that as a child, Elizabeth Bathory had seizures, uh, possibly epilepsy. Ah. And the current treatment for ep epilepsy at that time was to rub the blood of a non-sufferer on the lips of the ep epileptic. Oh so from gosh. a young age, she's potentially being taught <laughs> that other people's blood is healing. Oh, now, my gosh. Now, beyond that, there is no evidence other than testimonial evidence that this is true that she did any of this at all. Um, no one ever filed a complaint before her arrest, but of course, after her arrest, they have over 300 testimonials about this. Now, again, we're talking about spectral evidence. We're talking about hearsay. You know, we just know back then the kind of torture and forced confessions and things that, you know, could happen at that time. And you start to look at her 
she was quite a wealthy noblewoman. She married someone very wealthy. And when he died, she gained tremendous influence in this area. And the man who was assigned to be her sort of guardian was the lead investigator in this trial. So that to me seems like a conflict of interest. <laughs> yeah, that would be a little um, conflict. So again, to me, it's that perfect example of the reality of what's going on and, you know, the, 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 the stored fantasy that we make up around it. And, and I think to link back to True Blood, we see that a lot. You know, what's really going on, the politics of something and the prejudices involved versus the true story. Yep. And all of that is all happening today. And then it just looks different, but I sure am glad I live now. Next week on Truest Blood, we are wrapping up the season with the Fiona Shaw. I am so excited. She is a powerhouse of the stage and screen, an idol of mine. And it is, it is just a pleasure to hear her share her experience. And you have all seen her. We've all been watching her perform for decades, <laughs> especially, right? We all know her as Petunia Dursley yeah. in Harry Potter. <laughs> this interview is not to be missed. So thanks for listening, Trubies. Subscribe and follow wherever you listen to your podcasts, and we'll see you next week. Y'all come back now, you here. Truest Blood is produced by Safe Haven for HBO. Executive producers are Janina Kavankar, Kristen Bauer, and Deborah Ann Wool. Our producer is Gabrielle Gallon, and our audio producer is Christopher Wool. Our theme song was recorded just for this podcast by Jace Everett. Additional music was composed by Timo Chen. And remember, you can watch all of the original episodes of True Blood on Max.